Assalamu alaikum. Cricopharyngeal dysfunction is one of the commonest causes for a functional pharyngeal dysphagia. Cricopharyngeal myotomy remains one of the commonest operations designed primarily to relieve dysphagia. The upper oesophageal sphincter, the UES, is formed mainly but not exclusively by the cricopharyngeus muscle. Other parts that contribute to the upper oesophageal sphincter include the lower fibers of the thyropharyngeus muscle and the upper centimeter or two of the esophagus. This is of surgical importance as during a cricopharyngeus myotomy, uh, muscle fibers from all these three uh, parts would need to be divided. The uh, cricopharyngeus muscle at rest has a continuous tone of about 90 millimeters mercury plus or minus 30 millimeters mercury. During swallowing, during a normal swallow, it relaxes and the pressure drops from 90 millimeters to less than 10 millimeters mercury. This would allow a, a bolus in the pharynx to pass through the relaxed segment at a speed of about four centimeters per second, the muscle remains relaxed for about 1.5 seconds, and the pressure in the pharynx of about 60 millimeters mercury plus or 20 uh, plus or minus 20 millimeters mercury would uh, easily push the bolus um, through the relaxed muscle. The other point of surgical importance is that the recurrent laryngeal nerve lies uh, quite close in here, the gutter between the trachea and the esophagus and passes below the cricopharyngeus muscle, a point of importance during cricopharyngeus uh, myotomy. The recurrent laryngeal nerve supplies the uh, muscle uh, by, its, by its motor fibers. When the cricopharyngeus muscle has to open to allow the passage of a pharyngeal bolus, it opens up in two successive steps. It relaxes first when the pressure drops to less than 10 millimeters mercury and then 0.1 second later it opens up by the anterior and superior traction of the hyoid and the larynx on the cricoid. This um, opens up the relaxed muscle. This patient who has a defective opening of the cricopharyngeus muscle has accumulation of the bolus in the high, lower part of the hypopharynx just above the uh, muscle, the closed up segment here. He has learned to uh, elevate his larynx and hyoid manually by his hand and pushes his head forward and this opens up the relaxed muscle. The pathophysiology of the cricopharyngeal dysfunction is diverse. In some patients, the muscle is hypertensive and fails to relax due to various neurological problems. Sometimes the, there is a degeneration of the muscle itself, followed by the ultimate fibrosis, and also this would lead to failure of relaxation. In other patients, there may be a relative lack of coordination between the pharyngeal muscle so that the pharyngeal bolus reaches the cricopharyngeal segment when it is still in its tonic contraction and would not open in the um, required time. The etiology of the dysfunction can be primary when it is confined to the cricopharyngeal muscle alone, or secondary when there is a generalized affection of muscles and nerves elsewhere in the body. It can be a generalized muscular problems like poliomyositis or uh, muscular dystrophies, hypothyroidism or inclusion body myositis, or neurological disorders such as polio. The first operation for uh, uh, cricopharyngeal myotomy was actually carried out on a polio patient or in oculopharyngeal dysphagia, which is a slowly progressive stroke or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is rapidly progressive. It can also be due to peripheral neurological disorders in diabetes, in myothenia gravis, and peripheral neuropathies. How common is the cricopharyngeal dysfunction? Fairly common. The incidence is about one new case per 100,000 population per annum.
This translates to about anything between 5 to 25% of the patients you have seen and complaining primarily from dysphagia. There is a common association between the cricopharyngeal dysfunction and gastroesophageal reflux. The earliest symptom would be of a solid food sticking in the throat, particularly medications like tablets or capsules. This would lead to the patient trying to clear the throat by frequent uh, dry swallowing. Eventually, this would progress to dysphagia towards semi-solids and thicker fluids, and this would lead to a weight loss and malnutrition. Occasionally, the patient would present with total dysphagia, inability to even swallow his own saliva. But if the patient complains of pain during the swallowing, as well as the difficulty, then this is not a usual symptom and should raise a suspicion of malignancy or other pathologies. The differential diagnosis includes globus, scleroderma, and of course, strictures and neoplasm. This will have to be ruled out. The severity of the condition, the progression of the disease, or the response to various treatment options should be assessed and documented repeatedly by various assessment scores from validated scales. All these scales were validated. Some of them are subjective, reflecting patient symptoms, like the eating assessment tool E10, which reflects dysphagia symptoms, the GETS, the Glasgow Edinburgh Throat Scale, reflecting throat symptoms, the PROMS, which quantifies how the patient is perceiving his handicap and how it affects his quality of life. The addition to the PROMS is that the carer could also quantify the patient's handicap and how it affects his participation in social situations. And some are more objective using video fluoroscopy or video endoscopy, like the penetration aspiration scale for cases who have uh, aspiration or laryngeal penetration, or the bolus residues scale for the uh, residual hypopharyngeal bolus after swallowing, and digest, which translates findings from the penetration aspiration scale into grades like mild, moderate, severe, or life-threatening. The diagnosis is usually established by the use of the top three uh, methods of investigation, a functional endoscopic examination of the swallowing and video fluoroscopy and transnasal uh, flexible oesophagoscopy under sedation. This would allow uh, the establishing of the diagnosis. Other investigations may also be required, barium swallow. For example, there is a doubt about a pharyngeal pouch Rigid endoscopy or CT scan and MRI scans are used if there is any suspicion of malignancy or any doubt about the, the final diagnosis. The other three investigations would be used in selecting the method of treatment, like we use ultrasound scans when injecting the cryopharyngeous muscle with Botox. The same applies for electromyography and manometry is used before establishing whether the patient needs a uh, cricopharyngeal biotomy or not. Every patient will have a functional endoscopic examination of the swallowing, PEAS. This will start by um, examination of the pharynx at rest well, before introducing any colored food or drinks to see if there is any, um, any possible lesions anywhere in the hypopharynx or in the larynx, uh, mobility of the vocal cords, any retained secretions or pooling of saliva in the fossae or the vellicula, any signs of laryngopharyngeal reflux, any signs of eminent um, laryngeal penetration or aspiration. So this is something you would do for every patient. And then colored food or drink will be given to the patient to allow endoscopic visualization of how the patient will handle his food. Um, this would allow estimation of the uh, various problems in the flow of the bolus or the timing or the patterns. You would see, for example, a pooling of the bolus and the hypopharynx above the cricopharyngeus, like in this patient, 
or any signs of uh, laryngeal penetration or uh, tracheal aspiration. And these would be scored into the relevant scaling system, the penetration aspiration scale for aspiration and the bolus residue scale for dysphagia. The location of any bolus residual parts in the hypopharynx would be noted. In cricopharyngeal dysfunction, you would expect to see pharyngeal residue in the lower part of the hypopharynx, like in here, just above the level of the cricopharyngeal sphincter. And then every patient would have a flexible oesophagoscopy to examine the lower part of the hypopharynx, the cricopharyngeal segment, and once the oesophagus itself is entered, you would note any pathologies inside the uh, oesophagus, any signs of reflux or any other lesions or strictures or stenosis in the uh, oesophagus. And the third essential investigation in the cases of suspected cricopharyngeal myotomy, beside the fees and the flexible endoscopy, would be the video fluoroscopy. This again will show what happens to a pharyngeal bolus during swallowing, whether there is any aspiration, like in here, into the larynx and the trachea, and whether there is any hold up of the bolus above the cricopharyngeal. And how does it actually open? Is there any movements of the larynx and the hyoid uh, upwards and anteriorly, or if there is any problems in the tongue base? These three things, the tongue base, the hyolaryngeal movement, and what really happens at the uh, cricopharyngeal sphincter are the additional uh, benefits from having a video fluoroscopy. The other thing a video fluoroscopy may show is a cricopharyngeal bar. This is a radiological sign of a prominence in the cricopharyngeal area. This is a fairly common finding. It's somewhere around 10% of video fluoroscopies will show a cricopharyngeal bar, anything between 5 to 19%. The exact significance of the bar is still debatable. It may resemble an early stage of cricopharyngeal dysfunction, but it's also commonly associated with other uh, causes for pharyngeal dysphagia. Several studies have demonstrated that the presence of a cricopharyngeal bar is a common radiological finding in barium swallows and in video fluoroscopies. But these studies had failed to show the significance of having a cricopharyngeal bar. In one of the large studies, with 124 patients with dysphagia, about 20% uh, of the patients had cricopharyngeal bar, 24 patients. But only one patient, only one single patient, the bar was the cause of the dysphagia. In at least a third of the cases, there were other pathologies demonstrated pathologies that accounted for the dysphagia. When manometry was used to investigate the significance of having a cricopharyngeal bar, it was found that there is a normal resting pressure, a tonic pressure of the cricopharyngeal. This is normal. And there is also normal relaxation of the muscle. What is abnormal is restricted opening, restricted sphincter opening, and also increased resistance to the flow of the uh, bolus across the sphincter. Despite this, some authorities had tried uh, myotomy as a treatment for the cricopharyngeal bar and report good results. The management of the cricopharyngeal dysfunction can be either conservative management or interventional management. In Almost all cases, with the exception of three groups of patients, we start with the conservative management, except in patients who have aspiration, in patients who have absolute dysphagia and cannot swallow their own saliva, or in patients who have signs of severe malnutrition. Conservative management would be uh, through diet modification, voice and swallowing retraining, swallowing postures, 
and in few cases some trial of medications while the intervention and interventional management would entail things like botox injection open or endoscopic cricopharyngeus myotomy this is the number one step in the management of cricopharyngeus dysfunction patients diet modifications oral feeding is important to patients and it is best kept whenever possible what can be changed is the volume the consistency or the rate of administration of the bolus food and this can be achieved by various meth methods like blending for example making the bolus as homogeneous as possible would uh, make it more preferable and tolerable by the patients also the additions of thickeners various thickeners guided by the results of the video endoscopy or the video fluoroscopy it will show what volume consistency or rate of administration is best handled by the patient the diet can also be uh, modified by the addition of sour or cold boluses these are better handled by the patient because they significantly shorten the pharyngeal transit time addition of things like citric acid for example would also improve the swallowing reflex presumably because of their maximum effect on the increasing the uh, sensory input of the uh, swallowing reflex but in some patients oral feeding cannot be maintained or should be stopped particularly in cases of aspiration or if the patient have absolute dysphagia or signs of severe malnutrition in those patients you try first a passage of a nasogastric fine bore tube to buy some time followed by consideration of gastrostomy either open gastrostomy or the more usual percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy in addition to diet modifications there are other ways in the conservative management of a cricopharyngeal dysfunction patients including various swallowing therapy techniques like strengthening of some groups of muscles particularly the suprahyoid muscles helping in the opening of the sphincter by anterior and superior displacement of the larynx biofeedback and thermal or gustatory stimulation of the swallowing several medications were tried in the treatment of the cricopharyngeal dysfunction patient with very little uh, success rates things like sedatives muscle relaxants gastrointestinal motility medications have all failed to show any real improvement the real exception for this is the medical treatment of uh, reflux by proton pump inhibitors and antacids and in the cases of cricopharyngeal dysfunction due to myothenia gravis for example or parkinson's disease these are the exceptions to the rule when medications can be of some help when the conservative management fails to control the symptoms of the patients it's time to consider interventional management starting with botox injection into the cricopharyngeus muscle itself this will induce paralysis of the muscle causing a medical myotomy this is temporary however it lasts for somewhere around six months or so if successful it can be repeated um, several times but more importantly if successful it would tell that this patient will benefit from a definitive surgical or endoscopic myotomy to control his symptoms the dosage of the uh, botox varies between different authors some authors started with very low dosage and some would uh, advise 120 units uh, we now use more the higher dose like 120 divided in three uh, injections and three points along the muscle circumference the technique of the injection also varies some authors would give it through the scope itself uh, after dilating the muscle and injecting the muscle under clear vision and others would do it percutaneously under uh, for example ultrasound control you would 
see exactly where the muscle is at the back of the cricoid cartilage and pass the needle in three uh, different points along the circumference of the muscle itself. Uh, others would use uh, things like electromyography, needles inserted in the muscle and record potentials in there and use this for the injection of the Botox. How effective is the Botox injection in controlling the patient's symptoms? Anywhere between 40% and 60% of the patients would report some improvement in their dysphagia after the Botox injection. Patients who had the injection through the peroral endoscopic route under general anesthesia would also have dilatation of the muscle prior to the injection, and this would help if the muscle has some degree of fibrosis. Uh, in it plus the usual degeneration or spasm. So roughly half of the patient would benefit and the other half would not. We would not be able to tell beforehand who would benefit and who would not, but there are some uh, criteria like if, you have, if the patient have severely altered video fluoroscopic findings or have cricopharyngeus in coordination or have very weak propulsive action of the uh, pharyngeal muscles, Those, these are the patients who would probably fail to have any benefit from the Botox injection and would require uh, some other form of treatment. And this is a summary table of the outcome of Botox injection in cricopharyngeous uh, dysfunction patients. And it shows clearly that in the big series, the, those who have more than 20 patients each, the success rate is between 40 and 60 percent. You get 100 percent success rates only in the smaller uh, reports. Some of them is only one single patient in the report itself. It also shows that uh, botulinum toxin injection is not without risks. Some patients had a recurrent laryngeal nerve paralysis, and some patients had worsening of their symptoms, and in some patients, actually, the patient died due to aspiration after Botox injection. The next thing to uh, consider in interventional management after the Botox injection is the cricopharyngeal myotomy, either open surgery or endoscopic. Here, the key to success is a good patient selection. The other etiologies for the dysphagia, including tumors or neuro generalized neurological disorder, should be excluded before attempting any surgery. A trial of conservative management before the uh, surgery is essential. A previous good response to Botox injection would be a good predictor of success of the myotomy. A slowly progressive neuromuscular uh, condition, like for example, the oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy is also associated with a good response, whereas the rapidly progressive neuromuscular disease, like for example, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, is usually associated with very bad response. Cricopharyngeal myotomy can be the primary treatment for uh, cricopharyngeal dysfunction, for example, or can be a secondary treatment together with other procedures in other conditions. As a primary treatment for cricopharyngeal dysfunction, the um, selection of the patient should also include verification by video fluoroscopy or video endoscopy of a cricopharyngeal disorder, but preservation of the pharyngeal contraction is essential, and a good hyoid and laryngeal mobility is also essential, since a myotomy in the presence of bad hyoid and laryngeal elevation or um, anterior rotation would not provide good results, and the uh, sensory supply of the pharynx should also be confirmed to be present. As a part of other uh, uh, treatment, a secondary procedure, in cases, for example, of aspiration, uh, 
mild to moderate aspiration can be helped by the myotomy. In pharyngeal pouches, this is an integral part of the management, plus the excision or the suspension of the pouch. And it can also be combined with medialization procedures in case of uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy, as uh, also can be uh, combined with thyroplasties, with hyoidoplasties, and in partial laryngectomies. Pharyngeal and oesophageal manometry, if available, would also be of great help in selecting the patients who would benefit from the cricopharyngeal myotomy. A manometric um, indication of a failed upper oesophageal sphincter relaxation in the presence of preservation of pharyngeal contraction would indicate a good response to the operation. The measurement of the intra-bolus um, hypopharyngeal pressure is usually a good indicator of the resistance to the flow across the upper oesophageal sphincter. It was demonstrated that if this hypopharyngeal intra-bolus pressure is high, then the patient is likely to benefit from the uh, surgery. But if it is not those patients who have a low uh, hypopharyngeal intrabolus pressure, did not benefit much from the surgery. When is the operation of cricopharyngeal myotomy is not indicated? There isn't much uh, evidence to support that the operation in the generalized neuropathic or myopathic patients would benefit from this operation. The success rate in the generalized uh, degeneration group is roughly 50%. And we don't have precise manometric or radiographic measures to tell who is going to benefit and who is not. And these are the groups of patients who would better avoid having the uh, cricopharyngeal myotomy. The open cricopharyngeal myotomy was first introduced in 1951 for a patient to have poliomyelitis. It remains the most common surgical treatment for oropharyngeal dysphagia. It has the potential to reduce the resting sphincter tone of the cricopharyngeal muscle. The resting tone of the muscle is in the area of 80 millimeters mercury and also reduces the flow of the bolus across the sphincter. The myotomy does not abolish the resting tone of the cricopharyngeus, but it reduces it by 50%. And this would help, and this would decrease the resistance to the flow of the bolus across the upper oesophageal sphincter. The operation will start with a transverse cervical incision, almost always on the left side. The incision will be deepened through the platysma, and subplatysmal plane would be created and the flaps elevated. The anterior edge of the sternocleidomastoid muscle will be identified, and the carotid sheath will be identified just anterior to this. Dissection then proceeds between the carotid sheath laterally and the larynx and the trachea medially. In this gutter, the dissection proceeds until the prevertebral fascia are reached. Um, this area is crossed by two structures, the omohyoid muscle, and this should be divided at its intermediate tendon, and the middle thyroid vein. This should also be identified, ligated, and divided. And once this is done, the larynx can be rotated anteriorly, to expose the back of the pharynx and identify the cricopharyngeus muscle. The recurrent laryngeal nerve passes close to the muscle in its anterior part, but the myotomy should be placed as well posteriorly in the paramedian position, well away from the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve. The myotomy itself should extend about five to six centimeters it involves dividing all the fibers of the cricopharyngeus muscle and the lower fibers of the thyropharyngeus muscle superiorly 
and the upper centimeter or two of the esophagus inferiorly. All these fibers should be divided. The pharyngeal mucosa would bulge into the uh, myotomy uh, wound, particularly if the pharynx is packed or if a tubing or balloons are placed intrapharyngeally. The um, cut end of the muscle anteriorly can be sutured to other uh, muscle remnants, uh, strap muscle remnants, to avoid the reuniting of the cut edges of the muscle and recurrences of the uh, symptoms. Once the uh, cricopharyngeus muscle is identified together with the lower fibers of the chiropharyngeus and the upper esophageal fibers, then the five to six centimeter myotomy is carried out, dividing all the muscle fibers until the pharyngeal mucosa is exposed in the depth of the myotomy. Endoscopic cricopharyngeal myotomy is an effective alternative to the open myotomy. It was first described with the use of rigid endoscopy and general anesthesia. You use a rigid scope, something like, for example, the weirder scope with adjustable blades that can be uh, opened and adjusted to expose the cricopharyngeus muscle clearly. It can also be carried out under sedation using the flexible scope. The operation is sometimes reserved for the elderly patient because it's a short procedure and entails a shorter stay in the hospital. Paradoxically, these are the patients who would be more at risk of the complications. And the reported complications for this procedure includes mediastinitis, uh, pharyngeal or esophageal perforation, hemorrhage or restenosis, and this can happen up to 6% of the cases in the largest series. The endoscopic myotomy starts with the placing of the uh, weird scope, for example, the anterior blade would stretch the inlet of the esophagus, the posterior blade will rest on the hypopharyngeal uh, posterior wall, and then carbon dioxide laser would be used to divide the muscle itself together with its covering mucosa down to the uh, bacopharyngeal fascia. This is the limit of the myotomy. Uh, once the bacopharyngeal fascia, this should be preserved to avoid any um, perforation of the pharynx and the esophagus and the potential for developing of mediastinitis. Several modifications to the original technique were then suggested, including the use of flexible uh, scopes rather than rigid scopes, and attempts at uh, preserving of the mucosal cover to the muscle rather than dividing the mucosal uh, cover of the muscle with the muscle fibers. Uh, it was suggested to work through a submucosal tunnel, try to preserve that piece of mucosa in an attempt to reduce the incidence of pharyngeal perforation. In a review of the uh, outcome of the open or the endoscopic surgery and 18 published reports, the success rate is usually somewhere between 60% or 80% uh, in most big uh, reports. Few reports would uh, suggest a higher success rates. The complications include things like mediastinitis, um, perforation of the esophagus or the pharynx, hematoma in the retropharyngeal space or in the neck, uh, pneumonia, aspiration, and vocal fold palsy. By this, we come to the end on this presentation on cricopharyngeous uh, dysfunction and cricopharyngeous myotomy. Salaam alaikum.